Hello everybody, welcome to Equity Guru. We have a super fancy interview here with the guys running the show at Standard Uranium. We have John Basio and the man with the plan, John Hillicray, with the Hillicray. VP Exploration? Yeah. Okay, and VP President. Exploration. We, and President, okay. So, the guy who buys the beers for everybody and makes <laughs> stuff move forward, and then the guy who actually needs to do the technical work behind finding the uranium. I'm all about uranium, as you guys are probably sick of hearing. And what I want to do right now is to get you guys' impression on what's happening in the uranium market. Everybody wants to know. That's the big mm -hmm. question. Now, we are here at Beer IC 2024, mm -hmm. and... There is there seems to be a different feel in the air this year as you know compared to last year and the, even the previous years. What do you guys think about what's happening in the uranium market? I hear a lot of people saying, "Have we missed it?" So, what do you guys? Well, that's a fantastic question. First of all, thank you, Fabi, for uh, having this interview with us. That's great to be at the Equity Guru Studio here and and talking about uranium and as you mentioned, VRIC, twenty twenty four. We spent the last few days at the conference site in meetings, listening to speakers, and I could say, hands down, uranium is the talk of the town. And we're getting approached by people, you know, walking the floor. Everyone's, um, everyone's excited about what's happening, what's going on. But as you say, have they missed it? Is it too late? Spot price at 106. Um, what, as we've noticed, like the big companies are moving up. We see the chemicals and the next gens and the Denisons, and their stock prices are going along, matching almost matching what's happening in the spot price. Mm -hmm. The long-term price is, you know, just under $70, but it's the junior exploration companies and the early stage guys that haven't moved. They're pretty much flatlining along at this point. And there's that big gap still. So I think the, there's a lot of room for the junior equities to catch up. I think spot price, like at 106, have we hit the peak? I don't think so. I mean, the reason that I think we're at 106 right now is fundamentals. And I think people are really starting to understand that nuclear is here to stay. It's green, it's clean. We need nuclear, and uranium has to come. And the only reason that it's um, where it is today is because there's no market for, for on the spot. There's no product to buy. So when when Sprott came in a few years ago and started gobbling up all the secondary supply, that's gone. So now when people want to go to the market to buy spot, they just have to keep paying more and more. And is there more supply coming? No. I mean, there's other things that are happening, but you look at longer term. There's no there's no supply. Yeah, and it's quite. Uh, I don't want to say funny because you know that this is money we're talking about. It's mm -hmm. people's uh, hard-earned money and savings, and so when you when you make an investor uh, investment or speculation, like obviously you want it to work out, and so but it but it's almost funny. I'll put it like that. Uh, how people are, are sometimes discounting this this run up to mm -hmm. 106. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my response to them, I guess, would say something along the lines of. When was the last time you saw, you know, a, a bear market of 12 years turn into a bull market last one month? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have it so that only the producers, you know, like really had mm -hmm. some torque and then call it the end. I have, I give no credence to, you know, the, the notion that it's over just because there is more movement. Mm -hmm. In fact, let's talk about what kind of interest you guys are getting uh, from, you know, the market when it comes to financing because yeah. sometimes what we see as retail investors is the announcement of there's a raise but we don't understand what's happening behind the scenes mm -hmm. and how hard or how easy it is to raise money in this environment. Um, I think, and correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong, that we're coming out of a period of a really tough market, you know, yeah. for juniors to raise Absolutely. money. Absolutely. Yeah. And so how, how is it right now as we speak? So let's put a few things in context here. We started this company in 2017. Mm -hmm. And I remember, uh, I think it was VRIC 2017 that Mike Alkin made his splash in uranium. He was at the VRIC show talking about uranium has to run. And here's the fundamental thing. He laid out his case. And I remember seeing that conference and thinking to myself, yeah, uranium's got a really good shot, but is it going to be this year, next year, five years down the road? Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the... Um, one of the, one of the it was around that same time we had just started standard uranium, and we we had acquired our Davidson River project, and then we stayed private for two years before we went public in May of 2020. So those first two years of trying to raise money 
as a private uranium company in a market that was full on bear market was brutal. Mm -hmm. And I, we were happy to bring in, you know, Mike Galvin and Station Cove heard about our story, our project, and they were one of our first investors. And that led to more institutions coming, guys like Guy Keller from Tribeca. And, right. and, uh, and that led to us getting some credibility, but still it was brutal to raise money. And then we got to, uh, you know, into 2020, 21, and things started to move. The story started to get more mainstream and financing was a little bit easier, but still it was, you know, you're primarily raising funds from, from flow through funds in Canada that were allowing you to put money into the ground and, and some, some groups from the US or others that weren't flow through. So getting the GNA money has always been hard. And then we had the big event where Sprott came into the market mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, yeah. and, and Uranium had that quick run for several months where everybody took off to, to year highs and multi-year highs for Uranium companies. Even the junior companies went up and a lot of general retail guys came into the space and then everything pulled back. And I think people got, a lot of the retail people got a bit burned on that because they jumped in when it looked like it was really taking off and it was sort of a false start, but but that's your range space. It goes up and it comes back, it goes up and it goes back until the fundamentals really catch up. Mm -hmm. And I think we're at that point now. Like 2023 was brutal. It was impossible to raise money, especially in the junior range space. We tried to do a financing in May and there was no money available. And we were not, we were one of many companies were in the same situation. So our exploration last year was just one project, our Sundog, and that was the start of the year. In the second half of the year, we had to back down the hatches and wait. And as we came, uh, you know, September happened, WNA, mm -hmm. and the, it was like the spark that lit the fuse and things really started to take off. And from September until now, like three or four months, boom, it went from $50 to 100 doubled in a few months. So that is, um, that's a rapid ascent. And now we're seeing money flow into the space. We're getting, you know, bankers are phoning us from multiple banks saying, will you take money now, will you take money now? And we're in a unique situation because we transitioned from, you know, just an exploration company to a hybrid. Right. Um, project generator, we can talk about that in a bit, but we've got funds now coming in from our JV partners. So we're going to have cash coming in, shares coming in. They're paying us to do all the work, so we get an operator fee as well. And we did our small raise in December, putting in 2.6 million into the bank. And then we've got, you know, some of the projects we're going to fund ourselves, which Sean will talk about, including our Davidson River project this summer, which is our biggest, our biggest project. And but the, getting back to your original question, is it easy to raise money? Is it hard to raise money? It's getting better. There's money now coming from multiple sources. It's not just the Canadian flow through guys or a few bankers in Canada. We're now seeing we're getting approached by people globally and Australians, Americans. It's coming from everywhere. So I think it's getting exciting. I think anybody who's in the retail space can understand that we're going to see a lot more exploration work get done because companies are going to get financed. The only problem is with these companies that don't have vendors, it's not you can't just show up, stake a project, and start working. You have to have permits. You have to have First Nations permits. You have to have vendors that actually do the work. And those people are getting harder and harder to find. Yeah, and you guys have kind of seen enough of the basin work, like the day-to-day, -day, mm -hmm. you know, grind of getting permits, of getting vendors, uh, you know, testing things out, and making sure that you're able to, you know, run a drill program from start mm -hmm. to finish successfully, which is no easy feat. You know, uh, you see some companies coming in. And sometimes, you know, they've rebranded from the last hot thing mm -hmm. and now they're trying to play the uranium. And you're, you're going to see a lot more yeah. of these companies. That's oh, yeah. normal, okay? Mm -hmm. This is like, this is how markets work. That's completely yeah. fine. A company that used to do, you know, like AI or cannabis or whatever else, and they're mm -hmm. turning into uranium companies. And you guys have the experience to say, okay, we know to go uh, for this vendor versus the next, et cetera. Uh, and, and things like that make a difference because at the end of the day, you have, you know, a period of time when you can drill and you need to bring the market results, mm -hmm. right? And then yep. you have to raise the money and do it all over again. That is the nature of the business. So I wanted to ask Sean uh, just briefly, you guys have changed from, you know, uh, a model of you have a ton of projects and a ton of mm -hmm. uh, land, all very interesting, but we're going to raise the money ourselves drill it, and if we hit it, we hit it, if we don't, if we don't. That's tough. It is. Right? And then and you capital guys, intensive. It, very capital intensive, and you have to you know, dilute a lot. Yeah. And now you're going more for a project generator model, mm -hmm. but you're keeping, you know, the fa the favorite one in the family close yep. to your heart. Uh, tell us a little bit more about, you know, why you guys chose to keep a flagship yep. and, and how that decision is made. Sure, sounds good. I mean, 
John and I have been kind of kicking around that idea for the better part of a year before actually doing it, making that switch. Last year, you know, as John mentioned, was was a tough year for us, for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, the timing really made sense for us. And like you said, we've, you know, been continuing to build our portfolio in the basin. We've, you know, since I came on in 2020, we've really only drill tested two projects, right? We've drilled Davidson, we've yes. drilled Sundog, that's it. So we have these Eastern projects that are fantastic projects. We've done some geophysics, you know, kept them in good standing, got them drill ready, we got our permits, et cetera. Uh, but we've never actually got to go out there and poke some holes yet. So I'm really excited to do that. Mm -hmm. And bringing in these partner companies, like you said, and, and bringing any, you know, non-dilutive capital to the company. Like John said, we built a fantastic technical team to go out there and run these things. Um, so bringing in some, you know, strategic partners to push these things forward while keeping our, you know, favorite child for ourself mm -hmm. is, it, it's perfect. Um, especially in this market, there's, you know, like John said, capital flooding in, you know, people are hitting us up daily, looking, looking for uh, different projects and, you know, we've, we've continued to add more. So we have a really nice spectrum of, you know, drill ready turnkey operations ready to go. Um, but then earlier stage projects as well for, you know, if certain companies or shells are looking to get into the basin and maybe not, you know, jump into a binary drill program situation immediately. Uh, so it's, it's nice to have the optionality there. And uh, yeah, we're really excited about it. So we're going to be, you know, three, four, maybe five drill programs this year, like just lining it up and knocking it down. So I'm really excited to go test some of these targets that we've generated on the east side uh, over the last couple of years that we haven't got to test yet. So really stoked for that. And then, you know, we're going to we're going to come back to the market and and go drill some of these new targets we have on Davidson. So we've actually expanded the project stake some more land to the to the southeast on the project and linked it up there which is the exact same geological situation as the jr zone that happened with with f3 um so you know and we haven't got to go back and drill it yet yeah. since 2021 right i think it's also important to talk to some of the, the new audience new members that are hearing about our company for the first time and understand who this guy is because there are so many new companies showing up in the basin that don't have any uranium experience, don't have any geologists have actually worked yeah. in Saskatchewan or worked in the Athabasca Basin and how technically challenging that is. So we built out a very strong technical team and Sean leads that. He's our VP of Exploration as well as our president. And we brought him over from Next Gen where he spent five years doing his, his, his uh, master's degree on the air with deposit and gaining relationships with so many vendors in this region. So maybe I'll let Sean talk about his experience first and, and the team that he's built and why that's so crucial for this market in the Athabasca Basin, so go ahead, Sean. Yeah, it really is. I mean, you know, getting out there, like you said, it's it's easy enough to go online. Saskatchewan has a fantastic, like, staking system and land management system. You can pop online to what we call MARS. It's the Mineral Administration Registry of Saskatchewan. Um, so you can just pop on there online, go on, create a login, stake some land, right? It's pretty cheap to do so, also. But if you don't know what you're doing, it's, you know, you're just, <laughs> just wasting my exactly exactly mm -hmm. one well, and that's a big thing we're seeing too is close ology and it's like oh we you know picked up all this land next to something good it, the geology doesn't work that way it doesn't care about you know land borders and that kind of thing and oftentimes the uranium deposit sits right on the claim boundary and half of it's on someone's and you know half of it's on yours but uh so yeah like i i'm a saskatchewan boy spent my life there born and bred and uh, yeah, lucky guess on geology. And then started with next gen immediately after, you know, was part of the team that, you know, made that discovery and took it to feasibility. So I started at next gen in 2013, uh, had the, you know, pleasure to work with a plethora of fantastic geologists. That's where I cut my teeth in the industry, had the, you know, very fortunate to have that experience and to work on such a unique deposit because it really kind of broke the mold for what we typically thought of as Athabasca style uranium, right? Because it's completely base, basement hosted. It's essentially like an orogenic gold deposit, but it's uranium instead of gold. So it's completely structurally controlled all in the basement. You know, I could go on for days. That's what I wrote my thesis on, right? So it was very, 
very invaluable for me to make a name for myself, to get that experience and to, you know, try and think outside the box for these things. So we're not just, you know, you see a lot of these historical drill holes on some of the land we pick up. They drill the sandstone, they hit the basement and they stop. And like, you know, don't bother looking down there. It's all, you know, right at the unconformity or in the sandstone. Uh, so like I said, Arrow broke the mold on that. We, we know that, you know, you can have 50% uranium at 900 meters in the basement rock, in the basin. So very exciting and, and, and cool to, you know, bring that experience to this new company and to, you know, like I said, think outside the box and look for different, you know, kind of overlooked areas potentially. And, uh, you know, we're not the only company doing that. Like there's, you know, I, I know most of the uranium geologists in Saskatchewan and, you know, good friends with most of them. And so there's a lot of really brilliant people out there, uh, you know, looking for these things, right? So it's, it's cool to watch, you know, our, our peers picking up good projects and, and, you know, chatting with them like at the conferences and stuff about that. Yeah. So it's great to see um, the younger generations kind of coming in. So, you know, I've been fortunate to procure uh, some really good talent for, for standards. So we have Mason Ermel, Ezra Mazeros, Randall and Freed. Uh, you know, I headhunted them from, from other companies. Ezra spent most of his career working for Arano. He's seen a lot of stuff. Uh, a lot of experience on the east side, lots of like mine proximal kind of brown fields exploration, but also completely green fields. He's worked on mine side as well. So a really good experience there. Uh, Mason uh, actually worked uh, for me at NextGen for a couple of seasons, same with Randall. And uh, he's got a bunch of experience doing, you know, he was kind of in the beginning stages at Denison, looking at their IR, ISR stuff, right? That's so, not bad at all. No, absolutely. These credentials are all top-notch exactly exactly and, and we're all young and hungry right so and then yeah Randall and work for for next gen you know did some did some work with Can Alaska ISO so it's a really nicely balanced team uh, you know with with these different facets of, of experience so and on top of that the money that you guys raise in order to go out there and explore is going to Davidson River yes right? it, it's not like you have to keep up and maintain the other, I want to say nine projects? Yeah, we got right? 10 now in total. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 10 total, so yes, yeah. uh, the other nine projects. Uh, so I guess my, my next segue into that is what's next? Are we going to have to raise money in order to go out and drill? Mm -hmm. Are we drill ready? Are the rigs turning right now? Are you going to do, to do a winter program, summer program? What is the plan for 2024? <coughs> so that's a great question and we're going to break it down to two phases here. So we can sort of use this as an opportunity to sort of split into project generator and what have we got going with our, with our peer, our partners, and then what is our full exploration program for the year. And then we'll let Sean take that one over. So sure. the first deal that we announced after becoming a project generator was our Sunbug project. That's one up near Uranium City. Um, I'll let Sean speak to that. That one is drill ready, permits in hand, First Nations agreements ready to go right now. We're waiting for the ice to freeze. So it's getting colder and colder up there now. It was a slow, warm start. Mm -hmm. Now it's changed and it's getting cold. And the ice, I think, was it's two feet thick right now. And it needs to get to about three feet, I think, before we can put the heavy machinery yeah. across there. So the timeline in that region is always the month of March. Sometimes you can get in there a little bit early, end of February, and sometimes you can go into April, but you've got about four to five weeks. So that project is JV now with the group that's about to be switched the name to Aero Energy. It used to be Anfield. And, and, sorry, Angold, and uh, so Angold is now switching to Arrow, and Arrow is led by uh, Galen McNamara. So Galen was with Sean at NextGen, yep. and coming onto that team as well is uh, Garrett Ainsworth, another name that people probably know. He was one of our directors at the, when we started the company. He's gone off and started his group, his company Sweden, and then he was involved with Kraken, and now he's going to be involved with Arrow Energy as well and working on that project up in the north. So what a team. And then we've got Dale Varan, who runs Fortune Bay. He's got his projects involved. So we're all bringing these projects together in the Uranium City. Uh, I mean, Sean and I have been talking with Dale for years about how can we combine the Sun Dog and the, the Mermac and Strike and make, get something to happen together. And then with Galen and, and Garrett coming in and combining land they've staked and putting it all under one team, it's fantastic because now we're going to have, you know, the infrastructure up there to run all year round, bring the cost down. We've got the drilling company that we work with. They're going to do the drilling. We're the technical team. Our, our guys are going to run the project and advise 
on the drill target, so it's fantastic. That's going to be stage one. Now, we're hoping that it gets cold enough, fast enough, that we can get the roads that can be drilling uh, in March. If it doesn't get, we'll move that target to the summer. And then, that, then we'll move over to our eastern projects, and that'll be our Canary and Ascent, and hopefully Atlantic as well. And then we've got our other Corvo Rocus down in the southeast, and then we'll come back to Davidson River for the summer. So, Sean, take your way. Walk us through, <laughs> walk us through the exploration plan, what we're going to yeah. do with each project, and and how much we're going to spend it roughly. It's great. We're, yeah, so, we're so excited to get going this year. I'm, I'm jazzed, yeah, for sure. So plan A, like you said, is if the ice cooperates this year, definitely did not cooperate last year. We were able to get up there. We had all sorts of issues with ice ridges and the ice literally moving and bending drill rods. Like it was it was crazy. Um, so plan A is to get up there. We got, we got some really good land targets. We hit some uranium in our last hole last year at the Haven Discovery. Uh, so we want to follow up on that. So we know that we can't rely on the ice, but we need to get a drill up there for sure. And, and for summer, plan B. You found something, right? Like, well, exactly. Sure you're dying to go back there. Exactly. So we have, we got a three year deal with Arrow now. Yep. So, you know, three years of guaranteed work. Yes. Uh, Dale's put his Fortune Bay projects in there. One of which is contiguous touching Sundog. Um, so we have, like hundreds of targets like it's the area up there is really unique because there's outcrop everywhere there's you know 50 past producing uranium mines like in this tiny little area um so there's lots of lots of you know blue sky and runway for athabasca style high grade uranium but also this beaver lodge like it's kind of a different geological thing but um the point is there's uranium everywhere hence uranium city but so plan A is to get up there and hit our land targets and then check the ice, see if it's moving, uh, flood if we need to to make it thicker, and, uh, and hit some ice targets as well if we can. Um, if, if the ice doesn't cooperate, like John said, we're just going to get a drill up there, we're going to leave it there, and we're going to do a helicopter assisted program out of Uranium City. Uh, like you said, Fortune Bay has got, you know, a core shack there, a house and everything, all this infrastructure in town that we can use. And uh, so obviously Arrow needs to spend money, at least a million bucks or a million and a half on ours this year. Uh, and then, you know, similar for Fortune Bay's project. So if plan A doesn't pan out with the ice, we'll get the drill up there regardless. Um, and then plan B is to do the summer program on Sundog and Fortune Bay's projects kind of back to back out of Uranium City. Um, so that's all fine and dandy. We got lots of lots of really good land targets to hit if, if the ice doesn't work out. But uh, winter program, we, we've been in lots of really, you know, advanced discussions on our Atlantic project, which is highway accessible. The highway literally goes right through our Western claims in that project. And uh, it used to be Denison's Bell Lake project. So it's kind of right beside ISO Energy's hurricane. So really, really good area. Not a bad neighborhood. Exactly, right. exactly. Um, you know, there's there's some historical drilling there. Every single drill hole has uranium in it. Um, we've got some really awesome targets that we've identified through the geophysics we did uh, last year. Um, so really, really excited to do that one. And that one is like insanely cheap per meter because we can literally pop off the highway and stick the drill out there. There's historical trails from Denison. We're not pushing new new bush or anything. We can just reopen this stick the drill in there and, and go go drill this thing for super cheap so if we can get the deal done in a couple weeks here that's winter program for sure um and then the drill stays we get the drill up to uranium city other drill does that and then it stays in what's called points north so points north landing is like kind of the exploration hub on the eastern side so a lot of companies are there um you know and that's kind of base camp for for several different operations so Go drill Atlantic, leave the drill there, spring thaw kind of comes in, and then we have the deal done on Canary, like John mentioned, with Mamba Exploration. So they're your Australian company. Um, really excited to to go drill that one. We did some geophysics on it as well last year. Um, just a whopper of a target. It's, it's never been tested. Uh, and then we have another target zone that looks exactly like the J-Zone Rough Rider deposit if you know that. Mm -hmm. um, so the size and scale of this EM anomaly is, looks pretty much identical to Rough Rider. One drill hole in it. They drilled it vertical because they didn't know what they were doing back in the day. Again, stopped immediately when they hit basement. 
really anomalous geochemistry there. Really excited to go test, follow up on that. Plus the brand new target that we identified that's never been tested. So that's going to be the spring program. Again, that's about a million bucks um, in year one. And then hopefully we, on the back of that, we do a set. So it'll be Canary and then a set back to back in the spring. Um, and then if Sundog gets pushed to summer because of the ice, then, you know, it'll be Sundog right after that. And then we're going to raise some cash to go drill Davidson in kind of the late summer, fall. Yeah. So, and then, you know, he mentioned Corvo and Rokas, two of our newer projects that are early stage. Um, still a re really great earning opportunity for, for a company if they're looking to get in and like I said, not jump into drilling right away. So we need to do some geophysics, ground truthing. Both of those projects have uranium at surface. Um, the Manhattan showing on Porvo is pushing 6% uranium, never been drilled. And then, you know, Rokas has half a percent in outcrop right at surface as well, never been drilled. So, yeah, we're planning to, to spend a little bit of cash on those, do some geophysics, get the guys out there, um, boots on the ground, ground truth, some of this stuff, and that's great news flow for the company as well. Mm -hmm. And that'll be, yeah, leading into Davidson, kind of like in the interim, but obviously we don't need to run the geophysics ourselves, so we can kind of get people going on that while we're, you know, in the background while we're doing other stuff. So. And then that's that. That'll be the year, and then it's you know three years of guaranteed work on all these deals, right? So it's. What about these other projects you just picked? Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's more. There's yeah, more. but wait, there's more. No. Um, yeah, we picked up some land uh, just outside the basin. There's the Cable Bay shear zone. Um, Cosa Resources has their flagship along that structure. It's kind of a major crustal scale shear zone. Um, goes right underneath the basin, so there's a lot of projects staked along that trend, uh, but deep under sandstone. So we're just on kind of the southwest extension of that structure outside the basin, so again, really shallow targets. Um, yeah, picked up an interesting chunk of land there, so that's Cable Bay Southwest. And then we've picked up a, another couple uh, just smaller packages. Uh, one of them is just like west of Key Lake, Kind of a long trend from where Phoenix and Griffin are, Denison's projects. Um, really good looking little piece of land. Uh, there's some other other folks in the area that we've been talking to on um, some consolidation because it is a small claim. But um, and same goes with another one that we picked up, uh, basically due east of where Gemini slash Accio is base loads in ninety two. Right. Um, again, just outside the basin. Uh, it's actually next to I think it's the Can Alaska. Base and Energy JV, the mm -hmm. Geeky or Geeky project. Um, so just west of there, a little bit closer to the basin. So all of these new little pieces we've been picking up. Um, you know, we're in conversations with with some of our peers. Like I said, it's the we're we're all pretty friendly nowadays, which is nice. You know, it's there's a lot of animosity. I feel like back in the day between these. You know, uh, but you know we want to see each other succeed, and we can all benefit from uh, you know some consolidation in the air, in the in these areas and uh, put something together that's uh, it's a win-win and, and more interesting for, for both companies and our investors. So it's, uh, it's a lot of stuff yeah, coming. Yeah, it, it, it really is a lot of stuff. <laughs> it sounds like this is going to be like standard busiest gear. Absolutely. By far. By far. I mean, one of the, you know, if you look at looking at a share price and you're looking at a company you want to invest in, the times when things really move are when, number one, when the sector's hot, so uranium is smoking. Number two, when the company is actually drilling or doing exploration work and there's news flow, that's a good time to be investing into the company as well. And you also want to make sure that um, you know, you've got a good team of technical people that know what they're doing so that when you have this marketing and you're talking to people, they actually can explain what's actually going on and having the people to do it and have all the vendors lined up and have all the permits and First Nations. So everyone's excited. We're here meeting with so many of our vendors this week at, at Roundup now. And they just can't believe how, how exciting it is that they're going to have so much work <laughs> looking at them for this year and next year. And uh, it's, it's awesome. So people are in a really good mood this week in Vancouver. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Finally, right? Finally. I know. Finally. Yeah. Now, yeah. Standard has been here through thick and thin. Mm -hmm. And I wish you guys all the best in your very, very busy 2024. I am looking forward to reading all about you know the, the news releases as they come out from various different projects and JVs that you guys have been able to draw out. Mm -hmm. Any last words, uh, maybe some advice to new uranium investors that are, are coming in and trying to, you know, pick out who's who uh, in 
probably what's going to become an, an ever increasing number of uranium companies available for them to, to pick up. Yeah, first of all, congratulations on making the decision to get into the uranium space and really start to do your own diligence and, and what's going on here. When I advise people as to, you know, have a basket, have a have some explorers, have some developers, have some producers. But when you're looking for the exploration teams and you're looking for, you know, that big torque, the big win, like when a company makes a discovery, that's when they do what F3 did last year. They go yeah. from five cents to 45 cents within a, within a month or two, right? Mm -hmm. That's the opportunity. So look for companies that are actually exploring, that are actually drilling. And they're not drilling moose pasture, they're drilling projects that have got home run potential. And they've got some really good sniffs at it. And also, Make sure the team that they're talking about doing the work has actually done it. They actually are uranium geologists and know what they're doing. They know what they're looking for. And they've got vendors that have done the work in this region before. Because I can tell you, there's not just the locals that have been doing this work. There's a whole group of vendors that are showing up to Roundup saying, we want to come drill. We want to come work with you in the Athabasca Basin. And we know that it's not a place you can just show up and start no. putting drills in. If you don't know what you're doing, yeah. you're going to waste a lot of money and destroy the company. And when we say a lot of money, it's really mm. investors' money. It's yeah. our money. So exactly, that is really, really great piece of advice. Thank you so much, John Bay and Sean Hilliker mm. from Standard Uranium. None, none other than Standard Uranium. You're going to hear a lot about mm. them in the coming months, and I'll for sure be watching them as well. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you very, very soon.